Today we'll be talking about Firestarter, starring Drew Barrymore. Good grief. So, Stephen King turned 70 today, and I'm not reviewing uh, his current hit, uh, It. <laughs> I'm actually going to be reviewing Firestarter. Now, this book's from 1980. It's a, you know, it's a Stephen King book, and... This was a 1984 movie starring Drew Barrymore, right after E.T., so primetime fame for her as a kid, uh, and it was before all of her crazy, like, early adult, like, you know, preteen hijinks. So it was before then. Um, but you got Drew Barrymore, you got Heather Locklear, yes, that Heather Locklear. You got uh, Martin Sheen. <laughs> looking extremely young and way before West Wing. You have George C. Scott, who's just a crazy person anyway. And then you even have Art Carney. <laughs> Where do you get a cast like this? So, I'll be honest with you. Um, this movie, in terms of how it relates to the book... It's pretty spot on. Um, there are a few flashbacks that aren't included in the movie, but to be honest, it's almost two hours. So, like, just with the movie in itself anyway. So it's just as well that um, not every single scene is included. And um, there are a few things that aren't really explained, but it's probably for the best. Um, you know, it's that whole visual storytelling aspect. So... Word has it that Stephen King himself didn't really like this movie, and after giving it a viewing, I can see why he didn't like it, especially at the time. Um, you know, it's the darkness isn't what's going to bother Stephen King, but making sure everything is explained and understood is going to bother him. Uh, one big thing about this, like in the book, it's obviously you know explained because that's what Stephen King does. Uh, there's this experiment with psychedelics that uh, goes haywire, and it's uh, distributed by the government, this agency called The Shop, um, and it goes wrong. And two of the patients have a kid, and that kid is Drew Barrymore in this movie. And she has special powers that she is learning how to control, and they're on the run from the government. Okay, so that's pretty much the plot line. Um, in terms of how it, like, you know, goes on, um, I would say they're pretty spot on with the book. I mean, you know, it's 1980. It's pre-PC nature of many things, you know? Uh, you know, we call them Indians. Um, George C. Scott's character is actually supposed to be uh, this, like, you know... Cherokee, maybe not Cherokee, but, you know, point is, like, the Native American, um, but he always talks about how he's the great Indian, and he sees this Indian aspect when he's chasing after Charlie, uh, Drew Barrymore's, uh, character, uh, short for Charlene, um, in the movie, they don't really give him a missing eye, which I think would have added to the creepiness and made this character of Rainbird, I don't know, more more threatening you know George C. Scott's just more of a just kind of like taunter uh, and he looks more sadistic than scary which you would think sadistic would be scarier than scary but he just looks like he's up to a lot of trouble but actually not doing anything he'll make actions in the movie but you know you're kind of like yeah okay you know you're not as not as scary as what I was envisioning when I was reading this. Um, one thing I really appreciate about the movie is the effects. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you can tell from the name and from the poster, there's going to be a lot of fire involved. Um, the fire effects are pretty cool. Um, it was it was cool seeing the different government agents, you know, live on fire. Yes, I know that makes me sound like a, 
like a sick person that you know should be uh, committed. <laughs> but uh, to be fair, you're given enough empathy for these characters that you know you want to see any adversaries you know go away. And the main way they're gonna go away is with this girl's uh, pyrokinesis. Now, this is, this book, movie, you know, whatever you want to call it, this property has a few like big plugs for like what Stephen S. Stephen King esque things. Um, you have this whole thing called the push, which um, Drew Barrymore's dad um, in the movie, um, he was the one that was on the experiments, and you got this like thing called push where you can more or less like bend people's minds to obey your every will. Pretty cool, um, but it hurts him. So he can't do it all the time. So it's a, you know, it's a blessing and a curse at the same time. It gives him, you know, pounding headaches that are way worse than hangovers. And, you know, and as, as I did with Stephen King books, there's, you know, some element of him in these books, whether or not it's the, English professor in this dad, um, or it's the, you know, occasional lapses and, and booze. And it's pretty well known at this point that Stephen King's had his, uh, you know, his high times. Truth be told, I think my favorite part of all of this is just the kind of cheesiness and goofiness that comes with the setting, time, place, camera, pretty much everything about this movie. You got this whole camera setup that makes it look like a fun house, first of all. Like you're like looking into like a weird space. You're not seeing any distorted images, but you feel like you're like on another planet, uh, just in terms of what you're seeing. Some of the things don't really get communicated that well. For example, the push, um, you just kind of see uh, Andy, so that's Drew Barrymore's dad, you know, like one of the main characters. Um, you know, push his head in like this and keep doing that. Um, <laughs> he looks so devilish when he does it. <laughs> it just makes me laugh. Um, and then seeing like the gun like fly out of the person's hand, of course, uh, it's pretty great. Um, Drew Barrymore, <sighs> she's not bad, but this is definitely not her A moment in her career. You know, she's probably riding that high from E.T. Uh, even before she started getting high, too. And, um, you know, she's okay. But, you know, her acting's just kind of there. And you definitely know that this girl, um, you know, really can't handle her fire that well, which I think adds to the movie. So maybe that was intentional. So I'll give that a pass. Like, that part of it. Um, some things are a bit rushed in this movie that really don't make sense unless you've read the book. Um, you have about halfway through, um, they get captured, uh, the, the father-daughter duo. Um, and then all of these experiments, um, are attempted to be performed, and you just get this feeling that uh, other things are going on. Um, like outside of the story even that was intended. You have Martin Sheen, who I wouldn't say, you know, jumps the shark in his hamminess, but is definitely over the top in this one. And I have to admit, seeing someone that's all, you know, prestigious and all fancy fancy in the West Wing act like a complete goofball and just like an eccentric villain of sorts. It's weird and refreshing at the same time. Um, George C. Scott, he's he's pretty awesome. He's even more over the top than Martin Sheen, if that's believable, which I guess it is if you haven't seen this movie, but you know what you're going to do. Um, one thing that, like I said earlier, is that in the book, he's missing an eye, like missing it, period. And it's not like they shy away from showing gore in this movie. They show people earlier on with missing eyes so it's not like it was that hard to do maybe like george c scott had something in his contract i don't know but he put like an eye patch over his eye and you know maybe like his eye was like blind but it was still there but you know 
I personally think it's, you know, creepier if the entire eye is missing and the person's still there. Like I said, probably just was really hard to do in 1984. I don't know. I mean, there are some pretty cool effects, you know. This is the same year Nightmare, Nightmare on Elm Street came out. So, see. Um, some things, you know, feel even more abbreviated than you'd expect. Heather Locklear's part in this movie is very brief. Um, one of the things that they do is uh, more or less um, kill her off pretty quick. They do that in the book too, but it seems even more abrupt. She really doesn't have much of a character at all in this movie, which is a bummer because a lot of uh, Charlie's complexes come from her interactions with her mom. So you kind of think they would want to develop that a little more, but you know, uh, time is of the essence, I guess. Um, you know, Art Carney plays this uh, driver, like truck driver, like just, you know, pickup truck driver who picks up the hitchhiking uh, Andy and Charlie, um, brings them home, and then like figures their stuff out. And there's like the scene in the middle of the movie where um, all the secret agents come out to play because they track them down and uh, Charlie sets them all on fire. Immensely satisfying. Um, yeah, I, I know it makes me sound bad, but oh well, it, it was great. If you're watching this movie, like, you know, if you're sitting down and watch this movie already, you know fire's going to come in somewhere. So this is part of its payoff. And then, of course, at the very end, there's like a big climax scene where like the fire goes into overdrive. And I mean like, oh, like maximum overdrive. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you wonder... Is it ever going to end? Um, yeah. So, unfortunately, um, Andy becomes disposable to them after they they just can't get him to push things anymore. They try to push him. The whole idea is they want these two locked up so that they can train them via government style so that they can use them at their, at their free will. Or, you know, at the lack of, the, you know people's free will um but they find them to be a waste of time and they and they kill him in this whole shootout process they like promise maui and you know that's like not gonna happen and of course it doesn't happen but you know charlie sets everything virtually everything on fire and it's great and then they're just kind of like carter off in someone else's truck not really explained and they go back to Art Carney and his wife's house in Vermont. You might have seen that in like a quick, you know, flash on the screen of, you know, text on the you know, movie. But, you know, it's not really conveyed well in terms of just how she got there. And then it just ends. It just ends. You're like, what? And <sighs> the ending didn't piss me off. As I've known some Stephen King movies to, to do that, you know, have all this build up and then just kind of meh. You know, at least the climax of this movie was great. But then it just, it just died. Like the movie just died. Um, which was a bummer because, I, I, you know, I guess to be fair, you know, what else are you going to do? I mean, personally, I was curious where this girl was going to go. Like, what she was going to do now. But... You know, to be fair, that's kind of the end of this story. And it's been going on for a while, so it's kind of, I guess that makes for a good enough ending. But it, it felt like a tacked on, like she goes back to the place in Vermont. Like, okay, like well, what? You know, now what? Are there more adventures? You know, they could have just had her like, I don't know, walking away or I don't know, maybe. Whatever. I guess there was a TV movie sequel, like, 18 years later, which looks stupid. Um, maybe it's good, but probably not. It has Malcolm McDowell in it. I mm, Let's just say I don't think it's going to be quite as good as A Clockwork Orange. No. So, in short, um, the, movie is, the movie is a bit cheesy. It's not, it's not really that comedic, but it, it's got it's a little bit of a cheese factor. Um, it's got its, you know, 
scary factor, but this is more like supernatural science fiction as opposed to like spooky horror. Um, really the most terrifying, you know, people, you know, villains in the book movie are, you know, government agents, you know, this whole conspiracy theory thing. And, you know, once they get caught, you're like, well, now what? You know, how are they going to get out? And they don't really get out, especially definitely not in a quick way. And I kind of wish Rainbird's character had been even more eccentric, which, to be fair, is, you know, hard to do. Maybe some things are just more eccentric in my head. I'll, I'll give it a pass there, too. Um, I, I like giving this movie passes. It, it just, it was fun. Um, you know, definitely not, you know, worthy of any big awards. You know, nothing fancy. And probably not even, I wouldn't even say it's his best Stephen King movie. I mean, shoot, you know... Carrie's a lot creepier than this. Probably also because it's it hits home a little more. Here you're kind of like, you know, who just signs up for experiments with LSD, you know, hallucinogenics, you know. But it was like 1968, 1969 when those things happened. So I guess anything goes in the Woodstock era. I don't know. Um, yeah, in short. I'm gonna give this movie a B. And happy 70th birthday, Stephen King. Okay, so I plan on uh, reviewing more Stephen King movies during the month of October. Um, haven't quite decided the layout of that yet, but I'm thinking at least two. I want to finally review the new release of It. I'd like to do a you know big comparison between the new release of It, the old release of It, and the book of It. So that will probably be my, you know, big culmination, and that will probably be around Halloween. And yes, I know that's a little late in terms of the whole game of getting the best, uh, you know, hits, likes, all that stuff. But it's going to be fun, and I'm pumped. It's going to be awesome. I've already seen the movie anyway, and I'm probably going to go see it again. So, just to give you an idea of how much I like this one more. Alright, so that is that. And I'll, you know, show you the whole list of these, you know, wacky movies anyway that are on this list. They don't really have, like, a top of all time or bottom of all time on the IMDb list. And so, here you go. Alright, I'll catch up with y'all later. Okay, bye.